Welcome to College of Complexes. This is our 470th meeting since we started in February 2009. We put a speaker on every week a different subject. We require a speaker to take a position on an issue or express a point of view that had before or against something. We don't care what it is. We give an hour to make a presentation. If they go over an hour, we cut them off. If anybody interrupts the speaker, we remind the interrupter that we listen only one fool at a time. It's one of our rules. Then we have questions and answers from the audience of the speaker, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals, everybody in this audience at once who gets five minutes at the podium here to respond to what the speaker had to say for or against. And our speaker gets the last word, gets a comment, and comment close the meeting. That's how it works. But before we introduce our speaker, we have time for announcements. Anybody have any announcements they want to make? Now's the time to do it. Any announcements? I'll make one, I guess. You want to make one, all right? Yeah. The Dallas Philosophers Forum is going to start meeting again on the second Tuesday of September. I forget what the date is, but it's the second Tuesday. And we'll be meeting at a Boca's Italian Grill in Richardson. Uh, the El Phoenix went out of business because their rent got too high. So they just shut down because they couldn't make any money. So uh, it'll be a Boca's Italian Grill and uh, the meeting starts at 7.30. If you show up at 6, you can have dinner and enjoy some scintillating conversation. Is it Spring Valley to the east or the west? It's on the, it's on the southwest corner of Beltline and Central. Oh, Beltline and Central. Yeah, Beltline and Central. A Boca's Italian restaurant. What is the meeting? Uh, uh, what is it? It's a Dallas Philosophers Forum. Um, I don't have a schedule with me right now, but you can look it up. It's philosophersforum.org. Can I just come up there? Come on, yeah, come on up there and make your announcement. I'm Arthur Rodis. <laughs> and you know all them Rodis boys. I just. And Arthur's the worst damn one. Arthur is the worst. <laughs> Absolutely. We are going to pick at American Airlines on Tuesday. Oh, cool. Hey. Uh, starting at 6 in the morning, we're going to have a free breakfast at 1408 North Washington. At 7, the bus will take us over to Fort Worth to pick at American Airlines and then the bus will bring us back at noon. So bring water and some power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> any other announcements? How's the time? Anyone any announcements? Alright. <coughs> well our speaker next week. Our speaker next week is uh, Diane Lee, she's going to talk about reflection and the concept of race, racial ideas, and racism. It's on your itinerary. I'm not going to read all this. August 24th, solving the crisis in America today. That's Gene Lance in City Ray. He was just up here. He'll be our speaker talking about that. And uh, that's on your itinerary. And again, I'm not going to read all this. Uh, August 31st is Labor Day weekend. We won't have a meeting then. September 7th, uh, how, low, how low can he go? That's uh, Carol Donovan. She's the Dallas County Democratic Party chairman, chairperson. She will discuss how every president has his light, highs and lows, and uh, she's going to talk about Donald Trump are long remembered as for his lows. But anyway, that's on your itinerary. Also, I won't read it. Uh, on September 21st, on the battle with the IRS, Ken Sauter, who just spoke here a minute ago, he's going to be our speaker. He'll be talking about his battle with the IRS. Okay, pay your taxes. Yeah, pay your taxes. <laughs> uh, anyway, September 28th is the next open date for a speaker. Anybody wants to be one. Now, our speaker tonight is Kenneth Williams. He's going he's to talk about why Trump must be impeached. He's going to discuss the constitutional reason why Donald <coughs> Trump must be impeached. He will also present an analysis of politics of impeachment in the Democratic Party. Kenneth concludes arguing in favor of impeachment both on constitutional and political grounds. So without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Kenneth Williams.
That's easy for you to say. <laughs> well, tonight I'm going to talk about why Donald Trump should and must be impeached. All right. <laughs> okay, so I, I I say I have some support for that idea in here, but I want to provide some support, some reasoning for why this is why I believe this is true. I'm going to make a constitutional case for impeachment. I'm going to describe some of the offenses that I believe are impeachable acts by Donald Trump. I'm going to talk a little bit about the political case against impeachment, because many people are against impeachment. Many of them make a political argument against it, and I want to at least discuss those ideas. I also want to talk about the political case for impeachment. And finally, I will we'll talk a little bit about the consequences of not impeaching Donald Trump. There are consequences if we don't impeach him. Now, the constitutional basis for impeachment is in the Article I, Section 2 of the Constitution. The Constitution there gives the House of Representatives the sole power of impeachment. The President is subject to be removed from office upon impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. That's Article 2, Section 4. If impeached by the House, the President is tried by the <coughs> Senate, which requires a two-thirds vote to uh, achieve a conviction. That's Article 2, Section 3. High crimes and misdemeanors. This is a phrase we hear. It sounds a little confusing. We don't know. Most of us aren't. We don't use language exactly this way. But let's talk about what that phrase means. Now, impeachment itself was intended as a check on the power of the, of the president so we could prevent tyranny. The founding fathers did not want a king, and so they wanted to be able to li limit the powers of the president, and impeachment was that ultimate limitation. Impeachment does not have to be based upon a crime that could be prosecuted in court. So impeachment could be for something that's also a crime, but it doesn't have to be based upon that. The term high crimes and misdemeanors was used to define the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. That's from the Federalist Papers, number 65. In modern language, high crimes and misdemeanors essentially means what we mean when we say abuse of power. Some of the crimes, uh, now, talking about some of the things that I think President Trump could be impeached for, uh, I know I have an hour to talk, and, and we could really be here for a long time if we wanted to try to cover everything that we could uh, come up with that President Trump might be impeached for. I'm going to focus on six areas of things that I think are crimes that warrant impeachment. And these uh, are campaign finance violations, uh, collusion with the Russians. Uh, I know some people will, 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 will uh, that will be a button for some folks, but I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. Obstruction of justice, defying congressional subpoenas, emoluments violations, and finally violating asylum laws. Michael Cohen, who was the president's personal lawyer, has pled guilty to two felony campaign finance violations involving hush money payments just before the 2016 election to women who had had affairs with Donald Trump. Michael Cohen committed these crimes for the benefit of and at the direction of Donald Trump. That's, that's what he says. And in his plea, keep in mind, this is not just, we're not just saying speculation here. A court has accepted his plea to doing these crimes, and he is currently doing time in part because of those uh, campaign finance violations. If Trump can win the presidency by breaking the law, 
then impeachment is becomes the only remedy. Because currently we have an OLC memo that says we can't indict a, a sitting president. So if we let somebody break the law to achieve the presidency, what is the remedy? You're not going to just say, well, we'll prosecute him when he's done, because that creates that creates basically an incentive to cheat and to break the law in order to win the presidency. You break the law, you win, you can't be prosecuted. Impeachment becomes the remedy. Donald Trump committed these campaign finance violations in collusion, or in, in conspiracy, I should say, with Michael Cohen. He signed the checks to make the, 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 the hush money payments. And uh, this is something that I believe would be one of his impeachable offenses. Now, collusion with the Russians. Some of, our, some of our friends out there will say, well, he didn't do any collusion. They'll even say the Mueller report proves he didn't do collusion. The Mueller report doesn't use the term collusion in that sense. It uses the idea of conspiracy. It says we don't have evidence of a conspiracy between Trump and people in his campaign and the Russians. When I use the word collusion, I'm using it in the sense of what the word means in English. And what collusion means, it means that if you work together with someone for a nefarious purpose. Now, one can, one can say that the Mueller report didn't find the evidence of a conspiracy that they could prosecute. But gosh, if we just use our eyes, we saw lots of examples of them working together with the Russians for the nefarious purpose of getting him elected, for them to helping the Russians to interfere in our elections and to uh, prevent the election of Hillary Clinton and to support the election of Donald Trump. The Mueller report itself says that's what the Russians were doing, and it says that the people from the Trump campaign welcomed the interference of the Russians in that campaign. But beyond that, because when I'm talking about collusion, I'm not simply talking about the campaign or even the transition. I, I believe that collusion with the Russians is currently the foreign policy of the United States under Donald Trump. I will give you exhibit one, which I think is the most serious example, or at least the one that we have seen publicly, of collusion with the Russians. At Helsinki in 2018, Donald Trump stood by Vladimir Putin's side, and he was asked, do you believe your own intelligence services as to what they tell you happened in the 2016 election or do you believe the former head of the KGB, Vladimir Putin? And Donald Trump says, hell, I believe Vladimir Putin. <laughs> OK, now, when you're president of the United States, part of your responsibilities is to be commander in chief of the armed forces. You cannot be a commander in chief in the armed forces and slap your own intelligence services in the face. You can't do it. Because the military, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, they depend upon the information we get from our intelligence services. If you pull the rug under our intelligence services, what effectively you are doing is you are putting a blindfold on our armed forces. And you cannot fight effectively with a blindfold on. So when Donald Trump told the public and told the world that he sides with the former head of the KGB, Vladimir Putin, and not with our own patriotic Americans who put their lives on the line in the CIA, in the NSA, in the DIA, in the FBI, he said, I side with Vladimir Putin. When he said that, he basically abandoned his role as commander in chief. And for that alone, I would support the impeachment of Donald Trump. It is one of his most egregious violations of his oath. In addition to this, further in this pathway of, of collusion, they have blocked legislation that would make our elections more secure against the Russians. He has continually claimed that the whole attack on our elections in 2016 is a hoax. It didn't happen. We only imagine it happened, even though all our intelligence services have agreed that it did in fact happen. They also lifted sanctions against a corporation associated with Oleg Deripaska. Oleg Deripaska is a Russian uh, billionaire, an oligarch, who was a close ally of Vladimir Putin. He was one of the people who also worked closely with Donald Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort. Trump's collusion with Russia is essentially disloyal to America. 
obstruction of justice. The Mueller report documents 10 major instances of possible obstruction of justice. I'll talk about some of the ones that I think were the, uh, probably some of the worst ones. President, <coughs> President Trump fired FBI Director James Comey after Comey refused Trump's suggestions to let Michael Flynn go. Michael Flynn being his national security advisor who was caught lying to the FBI about his conversations with the Russians. And, and, and my, uh, <coughs> Trump several times tried to get Comey to basically try to let Flynn go. Uh, Comey would not go along with it. And as a result, he got fired by Trump. Trump ordered Don McGahn to have Ron Rosenstein fire special counsel Robert Mueller. He also tried to have Corey Lewandowski, a longtime uh, Trump associate, to get Jeff Sessions to limit the investigation to future uh, Russian interference or interference by other foreign powers. Don't look at the 2016 election where I got elected. Let's look to future elections and then we'll, we'll, we'll just look in the future. Trump also ordered Don again to write a letter that would falsely claim that Trump had never tried to fire Robert Mueller. He tried, he tried to force Don again to do that. Trump also encouraged Michael Flynn, Paul Manafort, and Michael Cohen to not cooperate with the investigation. He, he, did, this, he did, this, did this publicly. He, he called uh, Michael Cohen a rat for cooperating with federal investigators. You're the head of the federal government, and you call people who cooperate with the federal government rats. That's, that's John Gotti's language. That's not language for a president. And on the other hand, he praised Paul Manafort for not cooperating with the government. Define con congressional subpoenas. Trump has told White House aides and former aides to not answer congressional subpoenas and to not turn over documents to, to Congress. He's claimed something called a, uh, a blanket executive privilege. This is not a real thing, this is just something he's claiming. The <coughs> congressional subpoenas are the basis, are based on, on the power of Congress to investigate and to perform oversight over the executive branch. If the Congress cannot do fact-finding, then they have no rational basis for making laws. Therefore, they have the power to investigate, which includes the power to subpoena. If the executive branch is going to simply refuse to answer subpoenas, then what you're doing is you're completely destroying the, the idea of checks and balances in our system. And once again, we're getting back to having a president who operates as a king and not as a leader of a constitutional republic. Emoluments violations. The founding fathers were very concerned that the president could be bought by foreign governments. Article 1, Section 9 says, no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall without the consent of Congress accept any present emolument office or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Trump has made money from at least 22 foreign governments at Trump properties. In a real estate project that included hotels and a golf course bearing Trump's name, he received a $500 million loan from the Chinese government. In 2018 alone, Ivanka Trump, uh, his daughter, received 34 trademarks that were approved by the Chinese government. Well, Trump essentially uh, behaves as though the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution just does not exist. He says, hey, I'm a businessman. I have a right to make money. And he treats this law as though it's nothing. Even though to the Founding Fathers, this is one of the most critical things they believed in, because they recognize the ability of foreign governments to buy our, our president. 
and they were very afraid of that. Up until this particular presidency, we have not had any other presidents who put themselves in a position where this was an issue. People, you know, only like law students or whatever knew this clause was there. Now, it's something we all have to think about because we have a president who just believes this doesn't apply to him. He can do what he wants. <laughs> Violating asylum laws. U.S. Code 1158 allows any alien who is physically present in the United States or who arrives in the United States, whether or not at a designated port of arrival and including an alien who's brought to the United States after having been interdicted in international or United States waters, irrespective of such alien status, may apply for asylum in accordance with this section or where applicable. When we hear the discussion of caravans and invaders in the country, we act as though this law does not exist. It is actually legal to come to America and ask for asylum. The people who are asking for asylum are not criminals or invaders. They are actually acting in accordance with the law. In 2018, a federal judge found that the Department of Homeland Security is violating the law by not releasing most asylum seekers. So a federal court has already told them you're violating the law by doing this, by locking people up, by putting people in cages, putting children in cages. This is actually against the law. Between April 2018 and June 2018, Trump administration separated at least 2,800 children from their parents. All of this is illegal because people have a right to apply for asylum. Again, this is a, that is a, a brief, a brief survey of some of the uh, issues on which President Trump could be impeached in terms of that are abuses of power, that are high crimes and misdemeanors. I'm sure there are others you could think of and we could, again, we could be here for a while. Now. I'm going to now talk about a little bit about the political case against impeachment, uh, because there are a lot of people who say, well, we shouldn't do impeachment. And some of these arguments include impeachment, impeaching Trump will cause the Democrats to lose the 2020 election, both the presidential election and the House majority. Impeaching Donald Trump will galvanize his base and cause them to turn out in massive numbers and vote to vote for Trump. They'll say, well, the Republicans impeached Bill Clinton in 1998 and went on to lose seats in the uh, congressional election. And they did lose seats in the congressional elections. They didn't lose control of either House of Congress. They did lose seats. They'll say, well, there's not enough support for impeachment in the general public. And they'll say, I've had a friend who uh, said, well, you know, public will not want a uh, a messy food fight in a, an election year. And finally, there's the argument that the Senate won't convict him. And that, that one I think is probably true. The Senate, I, I, it would be amazing if the Senate actually convicted him. Now, in the political case for impeachment, some of the arguments I'm going to look at is the impeachment, impeachment is a process. And the impeachment process itself is going to educate the public about the crimes and offenses that have been done by this president. When Watergate, when the Watergate hearings were started, the majority of the American people did not support impeachment at that point. But through the process of listening to the witnesses and hearing the evidence, by the time that process was over, the majority of people did support impeachment. So the impeachment process is really the mechanism that will educate people about what this president has done. Now, we, now there are folks saying impeachment will uh, galvanize Trump voters. Well, there's, there's, there's something on the other side of that equation. Impeachment will also galvanize anti-Trump voters. And the last time I checked, I think there's actually more of them. See the 2018 election, there were 9 million more votes 
for the uh, Democrats in that election than it was for President Trump. And people were not turning out because they didn't want Trump impeached. Impeaching Trump will put a mark of disgrace on him that will hurt him in the 2020 election. If we look at the what happened to other uh, presidents who were impeached in the past, we see that Andrew Johnson, after being impeached, could not run for re-election. Bill Clinton, even though his poll numbers were high, well, you gotta keep in mind his poll numbers were high before he got impeached. And there was a perception that what he was impeached about was not of significance. It certainly doesn't compare to the kinds of things I'm talking about with this president. But even Bill Clinton, who probably was impeached for the least serious offenses of any of the people for whom we ever went through this process, he was not able to help Al Gore in the 2000 election. Al Gore had to act like, Bill Clinton, who's that? I don't, he had, he had to avoid any, any contact or use of Bill Clinton in the 2000 election because that was the effect of impeachment. In the case of Richard Nixon, who was not actually impeached, he had to resign because of impeachment. My, my point is, no one has ever been strengthened politically by being impeached. The people who believe Bill, that, that Donald Trump will be strengthened by being impeached believe something will happen that has never happened in our system. No one has ever been strengthened by being impeached. The, the notion that he will is an odd argument simply because it has no precedent. Keep in mind, when you look at President Trump, President Trump is the only president uh, since I think they've been polling, keeping polling data, who has never had the support of a majority of the American people. Not in any poll, not one time. Okay? Mo Every other president you can think of, and whether you were for them or against them, whether you're talking about uh, Barack Obama or George W. Bush, George H. Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, anybody you think of, they all had the support of the majority of the people at some point in their presidencies. <laughs> Not this guy. He's never gone above 50%. Somehow impeachment will then magically now push him above 50% when people find out how he told Don McCann to write a phony document about, to basically to lie, about giving him orders to fire Robert Mueller. Now people will say, hey, that's my guy. I'm, I'm now flipping. I, I like Trump now. No, I don't, I don't think so. Not impeaching Trump, one of the problems politically with not impeaching Donald Trump, and uh, Julian Castro uh, said this in, in one of the recent debates, is that Trump is going to go around saying, if, because if he's not impeached, he'll say, well, they couldn't impeach me. I didn't do anything. There's no evidence. Therefore, they couldn't impeach me. That's what he's going to say. And he is going to hit the Democratic candidate over the head with that argument every time they talk about Trump's malfeasance and abuse of power, they'll claim, well, if you really had anything, you would have impeached me. So not impeaching is, is, is a real error, I think, on the part of the Democrats in particular. The, the idea that Trump will be exonerated in the Senate, if, if Trump is ex exonerated by his friend Mitch McConnell, that is not going to persuade anybody that he's really innocent because they know that the Republican senators march in lockstep to Donald Trump no matter what. They can't see anything wrong that he does under any circumstances. But if the Democrats, led by Nancy Pelosi, if they don't impeach him, then it becomes plausible that oh, maybe he didn't do anything. Because if the Democrats had something, surely they would have said so. So it is that that's why I think there is actually a political danger for Democrats in not impeaching Donald Trump. And finally, this idea that running against Trump or doing an impeachment process with him will produce a food fight. You are conducting a political contest with Donald Trump. It is going to be a food fight. That is the nature of this particular individual. You cannot have a political contest with Donald Trump that, that, that does not take on the form of a food fight. The question for the Democrats is whether they prefer to be on offense or defense. I prefer offense, and impeachment is 
the position of offense. Now, beyond the political consequences, I want to talk about some other consequences of not impeaching Donald Trump. Donald Trump's presidency has threatened the entire concept of checks and balances, of the rule of law, of national security, of freedom of the press, of the independence of the courts, and whether or not America, as an inclusive, multiracial, democratic, constitutional republic, can endure. He, he puts all that in jeopardy by the nature of his presidency, by the basic kinds of things he does on a daily basis. If Trump is not impeached, it will create a precedent that all of his crimes and abuses of power are normal expressions of power, of, of normal expressions of presidential authority. If you can't make a case for impeaching Donald Trump, then who would you ever impeach? How would you ever impeach any Republican president anyway? And, and again, this, is, this will be a problem for Democrats in impeaching Republicans. Don't, don't get me wrong, Republicans are not going to be upset by these, this precedent that Democrats create if they don't impeach Trump. They'll impeach the next Democratic president for jaywalking. But on the Democratic side, every future Republican president will be say, hey, what I'm doing, this is just part of what Donald Trump did and you didn't impeach him. That's, that's where we're going if we do not impeach this individual. Simply voting him out of office is not enough. There are people who say, well, let the electoral process take, take care of it. That's not enough. That means that Trump, who I regard as a criminal president, should be treated exactly the same way as Joe Ford or Jimmy Carter. Now, I, don't, I know some people in the room may voted for one or other of these gentlemen, but I think the great majority of us will agree that both Joe Ford and Jimmy Carter are honorable gentlemen who no one sees as a criminal president. Right? If we treat Donald Trump the same way we treat them, then we're saying there's no difference between following the law and not following the law. And that erodes the whole idea of rule of law. If a president who commits high crimes and misdemeanors, if a president commits, excuse me, if a president commits high crimes and misdemeanors, the Constitution has a remedy, and that remedy is impeachment. I think impeachment puts a mark of shame on a president. And it did that to Bill Clinton, who was, was someone who did relatively little in terms, of, uh, in terms of abusing his power. It did it to Richard Nixon. It did it to Andrew Johnson. It has done it so far to everyone who got impeached. Keep in mind, no one's been convicted. No president has ever been convicted in impeachment. So the notion that he won't be convicted, that's not a new or unique thing. That has been the normal pattern of impeachments. However, everyone who has been impeached has taken a political hit. Everyone. Everyone. And, and if they didn't, then Al Gore would have been marching hand in hand with Bill Clinton in 2000, and he was running from them. Right. What's the reason for that? It's because he got impeached. The other reason why you need to impeach him is because the people need to know what he did. If you, see, because Trump has a spin machine over at one of our networks there that tells the people every day he didn't do anything. They told the people that the Mueller report exonerated him, right? Funny that they think it exonerated him and then they cursed Mueller out and called him names and accused him of being biased. And, and they, so that tells you itself what they really think is in the Mueller report. They don't, they do not want people to read the Mueller report. Justin Amash, a Republican congressman, read the Mueller report, went to a town hall of Republican voters, told them what was actually in the report. Many of the people who were his supporters, who were Republicans, were shocked. They were shocked and, well, I thought he just exonerated him. I didn't think it was anything there. We need to, the impeachment process is important in this case for several reasons. 
to get the word out about what this president's actually done, and also to, 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 put a, to put a little mark, to put a little eye on his forehead so that when he runs for re-election, he has to keep asking questions, well, you got impeached. What about this? What about your obstruction of justice? I want those questions to be part of the debate. If you take impeachment off the table, he can take all of those facts off the table. Uh, as far as the mechanics of impeachment, the, the, the House basically makes a formal accusation of high crimes and misdemeanors, and then it's tried in the Senate where the evidence is looked at, and the Senate has to vote on that. That is correct. Okay, and if the Senate, if two thirds of the Senate votes for conviction, then the president is removed from office. That is correct. Okay, my question: um, Al Green recently uh, presented a, a resolution in the uh, House. And it was voted down 332 to 95. Most of the people voting against it were Democrats, and they were aware of all the stuff you're talking about. What makes you think that's going to change? Oh, well, okay, that, that's a good question. Yeah. Now, my presentation is not on the probability of, of uh, Donald Trump being impeached. That's a whole different conversation, because that, that has to do with the internal politics of the Democratic Party. My, my argument is for why he should be impeached. Now, will he be impeached? Will it change? Right now, since the time of the vote you're talking about, there's now, uh, we're now at a point where a majority of the Democrats in the House do support impeachment, right? There's approximately 120 that support it at this point. Now, will it go beyond that? I don't know. You may be, if you're suggesting they won't actually go through with it, you might be right, because the Democrats or not necessarily, they haven't necessarily seen the political downside of not impeaching him, but that political downside does exist, I believe, because Trump really is going to run around and say, I didn't do a thing. And that's something they need to consider uh, when they decide whether or not to move forward in impeachment. The other thing they need to understand is Trump has a base that will be angry about impeachment. Well, the Democrats have a base that's going to be angry if they don't impeach him. They need to consider that. And so this is, going to be, this is going to be tough. Like I said, it's going to be a food fight one way or the other. But I'm going to tell you one other thing on that. If, if the uh, Democrats don't impeach him, Republicans, I think, uh, Republicans interpret, Republicans are very uh, interpret, uh, good at interpreting fear. Fear is something Republicans understand a lot, uh, I, I believe. And if they don't move forward on impeachment, that's going to make William Barr think, oh, well, I can go ahead and uh, do a prosecution of James Comey or maybe even Hillary Clinton. Go ahead. The uh, Barack Obama campaign was uh, fined for campaign finance violations. Why is uh, Trump's campaign violations, why are those, uh, uh, why did those rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors? Okay. Okay, now, in the case of the Barack Obama uh, uh, campaign fi finance violations, which I don't know the details of, of those particular violations, were there any felony convictions associated with the campaign finance violations of Barack, of Barack Obama? Michael, I mean, was anybody prosecuting anybody in jail for them? Michael Cohen was prosecuted for lying to Congress. Uh, true, but he has two felony counts that he was also convicted of. Because those two felony convictions, okay. he pled to those. He pled to those. Those but, were not tried in the court. Uh, yes, but when one pleads guilty to something, and when one is convicted in a trial, it has the same weight from the point of view of a court. When a person, uh, when they have to fill out their job application later and it says, "Have you been convicted of a crime?" Whether you were convicted by a jury or whether you pled guilty, you have to check the box and say, "Yes, those are both convictions." In effect. Okay. And he so, was he was plea bargaining for less years, and what I'm saying is there was never a nexus established to Donald Trump in well, his well, pleading. Well, well, well. Now I, I disagree that there was a, not never a nexus established in that there was there was a tape in which what both Michael Cohen and Donald Trump were talking about the payments. There is also there is also these neat checks with Donald Trump's very special and unique signature on them, where he is compensating Michael Cohen for the payments. 
Does and, it say and, specifically for the payments to the women? Well, see, see, we can't try the case here, right? Well, we I mean, can't, we can't try the case point. here. But here's my point. No, no, here's my point. If, if the court believes that Michael Cohen committed these crimes, they were committed on whose behalf? Michael Cohen wasn't running for president. Donald Trump was. So it is clear he was committing them on behalf of Donald Trump. And the fact that there is a tape in which they're talking about it, and there are also these checks, these checks which were supposedly done for uh, legal, uh, uh, some kind of legal compensation that correspond to the payments he made to these women. Again, this is, this is something we could try out, but the, the Southern District of New York, when they uh, filed the papers mm -hmm. saying that, that Michael Cohen was guilty, they make a reference to the, um, I think they called him Executive One or uh, yeah, Executive it, it, something like that. They, 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 they talked about him as though he was part of the conspiracy yeah. that they were putting Michael Cohen in jail okay. for. So, so that's so, alleging conspiracy there. Right, and, and, and we, can't, we, can't, we can't, you know, resolve the case from a factual point of view here in this restaurant. But they did resolve it in regards to Michael Cohen and he is sitting in jail in part for those violations. And I'm saying that if he is, yes. I'm sorry, go ahead, Gene. I have, I have, I have a conch. Uh, would you disagree or agree with me when I say that I have always been afraid of impeachment of President Trump, even though I think he's destroying democracy in America? Because I'm scared to death of Mike Pence. <laughs> I, I think that's that. That's I've heard. I've heard other people say that. Um, I, I there are two reasons why I don't fear that. One, I don't think I don't think that um, President Trump is actually going to be removed by impeachment. I think the House would impeach him and the Senate would acquit him. That's what I expect. That's what I expect would happen. Uh, even so, I don't think Mike. Michael Pence in this remaining time of the Trump presidency, let's assume he was impeached and removed. I don't think Mike Pence has time to do whatever it is, Michael, whatever dangerous things we think Michael Pence will do. I don't, I don't think he has the time to do that. I don't think he has the political support to do it. Donald Trump has a ceiling on his political support. Like I said, he's never gone above 50%. Michael Pence's support, Mike Pence's support is going to be proportionately less than Donald Trump's because Donald Trump, for all of his, whatever his, um, whatever his misbehavior that I perceive, he has a certain charisma with his supporters. I don't see that in Mike Pence, right? Mike Pence would have an even harder time getting away with things that are not normally acceptable in American politics than Donald Trump would. Donald Trump kind of does a, well, hey, this is me. This is how I do it. And, and some people just say, oh, well, that's, that's just Trump being Trump. Mike Pence doesn't know how to play that game. Right? I'm not even sure he could have got reelected as governor of Indiana. So, so I, I, I understand the fear of Mike Pence on one level because he, he thinks there's some crazy things he believes. However, I just don't think he has the political strength to implement his crazy beliefs, even if Trump were somehow removed from office. I just don't think he could do it. Uh, my question uh, is, can you not hear me? I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, as uh, as far as we have gone in the Trump presidency, uh, there has been uh, appointments to EPA, uh, appointments now uh, recently to uh, uh, the uh, DNI to the. To the uh, uh, Director of Intelligence, right? So, basically, a lot of Trump's people are in the agencies that we are counting on, uh, and these people's, in my opinion, these people's mission has been to subvert whatever the agency they're head. Okay, so there's, you know, um, if you think that these agencies have uh, use in uh, American society, how would impeachment affect the damage that's already been done and, and it would, be, would they be ongoing? 
what's the likelihood that you know different people will get put into those offices? Well, the, the while, while while President Trump is in office, the likelihood is near zero, right? So uh, we we if we want to have different people in those agencies, we'll have to put someone different in the White House. Is the is the is the is the short answer? Go. Um, can I speak? Yeah. Um, question. Uh, by the way, I agree with you about Mike Pence. Listening to him is probably more boring than watching paint dry. Um, but my question is, I, I didn't catch the year of the Trump $500 million uh, loan from China. From what, what year did you say that happened? I'm sorry. Couldn't hear you back here in the Oh, okay, too. okay. One moment, let me see if I uh, yeah. Has it been during his presidency? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, been, it's, been, it's, it's, been, it's been during his presidency, okay. I'm not. So much for the pile of um, folders with empty pages in it when he was saying how he was going to disassociate um, if he was elected president. However, given that is the case, um, how, and, and despite the pantomime that goes on with his foreign negotiations with China, how much do you think that that $500 million loan is even impacting the stalling and, and all the pantomime that we're being subjected to with okay. such trade negotiations? Uh, and see, this is the problem with violations of the emoluments clause. Precisely. You, you cannot tell when a president does something, is he doing it because he sincerely believes this is in America's best interest? Or is he doing it because it's in the interest of his bottom line? You cannot tell. And other presidents have avoided this question by putting their wealth in a blind trust. We've had other wealthy presidents, mm -hmm. and they, they put their money in a blind trust. They, these other presidents also all showed their taxes, right? So, so now we have a president who both hides his taxes from the American people and conducts business and we don't know what business he's conducting exactly, and we don't know to what degree it influences the decisions he makes in foreign policy. This is exactly what the Founding Fathers were trying to avoid with the Emoluments Clause. Well, and if he's threatened that they're going to call the loan, you know, which they may call on the loan, if, if all of that's in the background here. Exactly. But in Donald Trump's case, he'd probably just say, sue me, you know. So, anyhow. Thank you, and an excellent talk, by the way, Kat. Thank you. Oh, we have a, we have a new question. Oh, this, this is a new question. Here. John goes first. John goes first. <laughs> Do you think that uh, Donald Trump, which used this, this classic case of nepotism, where he actually uses his daughter to stand in for him, foreign meetings where she shows up as a totally ignoramus and a total embarrassment. Do you not think that is a case for impeachment? Uh, I, I think I think one of the um, one of the offenses that he has done is the way he has used both his daughter and his son-in-law, uh, both of whom have security clearances uh, who uh, would not normally be able to achieve security clearances. I, I've served in the military and I've, I've served in the defense industry and I had a security clearance for uh, the great majority of my career. Uh, no one um, updates uh, 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 their security paperwork uh, dozens of times as Jared Kushner has. Uh, that just doesn't happen in real life. No one with those kind of conflicts could get a security clearance in any other administration, Republican or Democratic. It wouldn't happen. So this is a, a, a naked case of nepotism, and it does put our national security at risk. Uh, Jared Kushner has all kinds of ties to people in the Middle East that he does business with. Is our policy for the benefit of America, or is it because of a business deal Jared Kushner needs to do? We don't know. You can't know under these kind of policies. Yes, wouldn't, wouldn't you think, because of this, this emoluments business, not only by him, but his entire family. Uh, yes. It really, yes. really, really compounds the problem. His whole family's activity raises emoluments questions because 
both his uh, his his children are also in business. Uh, they're involved in his business as well. Kenneth, you uh, stated that you didn't believe uh, any former president had ever not trusted his intelligence agencies. Oh, that's not what I said. Okay. I said no for no no president ever stood on a podium with an adversary of the United States and say, I don't believe my intelligence services, I believe right. the adversary of the United States. Uh, presidents having problems or disagreements with their intelligence services, yes, that occurs. That's You're John correct. F. Kennedy. That's John F. Kennedy, yeah. that's George W. Bush, that's several presidents. But that's not the same thing we're talking about. John Kennedy didn't stand on a podium and say, I agree with Nikita Khrushchev, I don't agree with the CIA. That would be the same. Amen to that. Uh, did you say that that the Trump people welcome information uh, and help from the Russians? Did I hear you say that? Yes, ma'am. That's what the Mueller report says. Oh, I thought it said the opposite. No, no, it does not say the opposite. We, uh, I recommend reading the Mueller report. I've read the whole Mueller report. It definitely says that the Trump people welcome their support. In, in, in notes, for example, and I'll give you some specific examples. There's the famous example of Trump standing on the podium saying, Russia, are you listening? Go get Hillary Clinton's emails. That's one example. There's his son receiving an email that says that this email where we're giving you dirt on Hillary Clinton is part of the Russian government support for the presidency of Donald Trump. And he says, hey, if it's what you think it is, I love it. This, And, and there were other examples of people in the, in the uh, Trump camp Paul Manafort, for example, gave voter file information data to Konstantin Kolumnik, who has uh, connections to Russian intelligence. So yes, they did welcome the assistance of the, uh, of the uh, Russians in that campaign. Uh, Trump said, I love WikiLeaks, dozens of times on the podium. So I don't, I don't think that can be disputed. Um, Kenneth. Yes. Uh, Bob Mueller was a little confused uh, and didn't seem to know who Fusion GPS was. Do you know who Fusion GPS is? I, I absolutely know who Fusion GPS is. And uh, I, 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 Mr. Mueller, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to come to a conclusion as to what his mental state is. He's an older guy. I think he served the country honorably for many years. I don't want to, you know, knock him based on how he appeared to. Uh, in, in, a, in a particular testimony that he gave. I believe that in the main, when you see his answers uh, to critical questions about the Russians attacking our electoral system, I think he was clear as a bell. I don't think he was interested in talking about Fusion GPS. I don't think that means he doesn't know what it is. I think he, may, he didn't have an interest in talking about the, um, with, with all due respect, some of the conspiracy theories that uh, have been used to counter the discussion of the Russian attack on our, in, uh, on our elections in 2016. And he, he, he flat out refused to answer many questions. But to be fair, he also refused to answer many questions from uh, Democrats as well. And he uh, also uh, did not uh, choose to go into a discussion of uh, who examined the servers the DNC servers. It's not part of the, it's not really part of the Mueller report, which he said, my testimony is going to be limited to the report. That's what he did. The Mueller report doesn't talk about the DNC servers. So it doesn't who talk did, about who examined it. So who did examine the DNC servers? That is, that's, that's not, that's not a question that, that I, that's not something I've looked at, so. But that's fundamental to Russian collusion. It, it's not, it's, it's really not fundamental to Russian collusion because the Russian collusion. Uh, uh, when you when you say the uh, well, let me hold up. Let me let me let me let me let me step back one moment. The uh, when you talk about the servers, when you when you talk about the servers, uh, we talk about the, the DNC servers. Uh, let me correct what I just said. The Mueller report does talk about the attack on the DNC servers. I'm, I'm thinking Hillary Clinton server, which is a different <laughs> issue. Right. The 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 DNC servers. According to the Mueller report, it was attacked by the GRU, by, by military officers who were part of Russian military intelligence for the GRU. But That's did, what the Mueller report says. But did the FBI ever do an investigation themselves on that? 
it doesn't go down to that level of detail of who exactly examined the servers. So if, they, I, they, if I told you that CrowdStrike was actually the company who did an examination of the servers, would you disagree with me on that? I would have no way to agree or disagree with you because I have no basis to, to say yay or nay with what you're saying. I have no basis. All right. Kenneth, do you think that we'll ever, um, as a country, come back together as a result of the damage of this presidency? And the fact that you've still got one side talking about conspiracy theories rather than um, paying attention to documented factual investigations. And even if they didn't want to go there, the fact that they have, in their own time, if they watch any other news channel other than Fox, actually seen the president have the words leave his mouth and, and have been, you know, documented 10,000 misrepresentations and lies. And these are words that have left his lips. When do you think the people that are so connected to a conspiracy theory will ever turn around and really pay attention as to what's in front of them? and realize the emperor is wearing no clothes. Well, the, the, thing about, the thing about that, that's probably the biggest long-term question. Uh, what I, I mean, I hope as an, uh, as an American patriot, and, uh, and, I hope, and, I, and I hope and I believe we all are in one way or another, that we do all come together. But in order to come together, it's going to take time, it's going to take a lot of work, it's going to take, we're going to have to talk to each other and, and try to uh, come together to some consensus as to what, what facts are and what is really important to us, all of us as Americans. The thing that's absolutely clear in your question is we, that does not happen under this president or under his form of leadership. That, that really cannot happen with, with, with the path that he is taking because I think he deliberately wants to increase division in our country. Because that's his stock and trade. The more division he thinks, the better it works for him personally in his political career. And that's bizarre. Because, like I said, all other American presidents, um, there have been varying degrees of success, but all other American presidents try to unite the country. They make an effort, whether they are Democrats or Republicans. We, we have our first president who thinks that the more division we have, the better it is for him. And that's, that's not sustainable for us as a country going forward. Yeah, Kenneth, uh, as far as Jerry Nadler is concerned, I believe he has said that the impeachment inquiry is well on its way. Is this not true? That is what Joe Nadler has said, yes. The indictment for uh, impeachment in the House originates in the Judiciary Committee. Jerry Dandler is the chair of that committee. Uh, Thursday, we learned that the word impeachment appeared in documents going to the court uh, requesting uh, the subpoenas to be supported uh, based upon the necessity for the inquiry to go forward. The formal term impeachment inquiry is not being used, but impeachment has now appeared. So despite what you may think with regard to everybody being frozen into place with regard to whether you favor or you disfavor impeachment, and for whatever the reason may be that you hold personally, it remains that over time with more information coming out, your attitude may change. Now, one of the things in connection with this is the Mueller report, for example. How many pages, Kenneth? 448. 448. 40% of these pages have redactions in them. That means the report is practically incomplete. Now, not practically, it is for all purposes incomplete. And what information do you not have that Bar, the Attorney General, does not want you to see. Okay. So, 
you can see things still continuing to move and be processed so that there is a possible for to take place. Do you, do you think, Kenneth, that the transition for police, people's beliefs is going to originate or finally come to the point where there will be an impeachment originate in the House? Um, okay, that, that's, that's a great question, Jeff. The, um, will there be, uh, it's, it's all going to depend on what is done by the Congress. If the Congress slow walks the process enough, well, then maybe they'll figure out whether they, whether or not they want to impeach Trump in December of 2020. Okay, that's that's not going to really help help them if that's the the pace at which they go. Now, if they make a decision somewhat earlier, so that that could be one of the things on the table for 2020, then maybe maybe it will change uh, people's views. But interestingly enough. On those rare occasions, the little glimpses we've seen of the public getting more information about what, what has happened, like the, the, the brief statement that Mueller made that one time, support for impeachment went up. When, when Mueller testified before Congress, despite the people who, who were bas basically, uh, uh, how you say, they were grading him on whether or not he was a good Hollywood actor, and uh, which is not his job. Uh, but still support for impeachment went up. So the more people see about what this administration has done, I believe will tend to increase support for impeachment because not because not because I don't like Trump or whatever, because the facts such as they are will tend to support the notion of impeaching Trump. The facts aren't leading to, oh, what, what are the facts that you know really exonerate him? It's, it's, it's very difficult. On the, on the obstruction of justice question, for example, let me give you a, a, a brief footnote. There have been nearly a thousand former federal prosecutors, and these includes both Democrats and Republicans, who have said just the information in the Mueller report would justify a prosecution for obstruction of justice. Okay, and these are people who, this is what they did for the federal government, this was their job was to prosecute people. And, and they looked at that report and say, yes, based on that, they would go for it. So I don't think as more people are exposed to those facts that support for impeachment just decreases or just stays the same, I think it goes up. OK, I think you're done with questions. I think we're out of questions. All right. And you get to sit down. Thank you. <laughs> your turn to talk. So anyone who has anything to say, either for or against what the speaker had to say, you got five minutes. So do you want to be first? Or yeah, I'll be first. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Kenneth. That was a very uh, nice, uh, compact statement of, uh, of the case for impeachment, actually. In fact, uh, I think the case for Trump is far more serious than, than just the, the, the case you made. And that's really the case that he's thrusting the, this country towards uh, fascism. Now, um, a few weeks ago, um, uh, an author came here and, uh, and with his wife, and his wife said to me, have you, have you looked at this, this British series, Peaky Blinders? Okay. Now, and I did. And so what it worked, the Peaky, Peaky, Peaky Blinders is about, is about a, a family of criminals who get mixed up with the um, secret service and government in England in the, in the 1920s. And it ends up with um, him mingling with Oswald Mosley, who was a fascist. And so coming from a country that really broke its back on fighting fascism in the Second World War, I, I'm very alert to these problems because the 1930s 
which were a dismal, a dark and dismal decade, according, according to W.H. Auden, the great uh, British poet, um, was a fight between two isms, fascism and communism. And I think the, the appearance of Trump and the rabble-rousing he engages in is, and, and the Peaky Blinders made this point, actually, that they were, that, um, because they depicted Mosley and, and the um, riots that occurred in London, where, where, you know, he was, and he was followed mostly by the right-wing Tory party. They actually supported mostly. And there were many people in the aristocracy that supported Hitler and what he was doing. And, uh, and of course, uh, also mentioned in this series was um, Winston Churchill. And as you know, it was Winston Churchill, right at the beginning of the war, that said, our aim is to defeat Nazism and fascism. Now, at the same time, the Congress of the United States didn't realize, and I've had this discussion with my American uh, historical friends, that was a worldwide you know, existential crisis okay, of, of fascism. And they, they couldn't see it, and they ignored it until it bit them in the, in the rear end of the Pearl Harbor. But that was about two to three, well, no, two, two years into the war. But Churchill could see it, and that was a case he made to the British public. And when I see Trump speak, and it's always, it's always blame everybody else, you know, blame blame the basically the brown people who are invading America, blame blame China for taking part advantage of poor America, where really what's gone on is America's problem entirely. It's a failure of America, really, all these problems. Basically, they've gone around and, and half destroyed Latin America and caused all these problems with the CIA in, in control. And so, uh, to me, the big worry is fasc fascism, and I think Donald Trump exemplifies that with his rabble rising, because we've seen it before. And of course, the masses, the peasant masses in, the, in all countries, and including here, fall for it. And the German people did. They loved Hitler. Sim similarly in Italy, they loved Mussolini. Okay, and they followed him into war. And what did it result? Thirty million deaths. And when you hear Trump talk, I, you know, I lived through the war. Right, six years. I was born thirty-nine. So I remember it very well, and I remember the consequences of it. It was not pretty. It was not pretty. The American people have never suffered that. They think going around the world kicking people's rear ends is just great with the wonderful military. No, it isn't. And so they, you know, the, the, the general feeling is, well, let's let's use military force first, and maybe we'll negotiate afterwards. Well, seconds. you know, that is not. So I, I think I've said enough. But anyway, I think I think the biggest danger is we're headed towards fascism. I think Trump is leading us on that way, and for that alone. I think he should be, now, I wouldn't say totally impeached, but he must be held to account over what he's doing. Now he's such a narcissist, I mean, he's oblivious, as rich kids are, to any criticism at all. And of course, anybody who disagrees with him, out the door. And that's another great problem. He doesn't listen to anybody, he doesn't know anything, he has a very poor education, he's a bargain. And so, you know, he's, I don't think he's fit for office. to a woman. Okay. I wanted to share a, Tom, quote, a quiz that I read online today in the New York Times. Talk a little louder. I wanted to share <clears throat> a quiz that I took online from the New York Times. My voice is fine. It was, let us predict whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. And the biggest factor was, are you black, Hispanic, or Asian? And if you say yes, you lean Democratic. And I took the quiz, and um, my factor was, OK, I'm white, I'm not religious. And what was the other one? Uh, oh, and I have, and I have um, I 
didn't say, did you finish college? It just, did you attend college? So I leaned 67% Democratic. Then I did it for Tom in my head, and I put him down as Catholic, and it put him right at 50%. So if you put down your Baptist, your white, and your Baptist, and you have had no college education, you were right there Republican. Or if you had a college education, or, or if you just attended college, it puts you right in the middle again. So it was very interesting how race, education, and your and what else, religion, are the biggest factors. That's all I want to say. Okay. convinced me. I told my traveling compadre that I was going to rebuttal it. <laughs> he destroyed a lot of my rebuttal, but I, uh, uh, a rebut not that he doesn't need to be impeached, but whether it's a plus or minus, if the House moves and the Senate doesn't, uh, he has a way with words. Uh, I don't think he hasn't done anything to reach out to broaden his base, but he's really keeping the base intact. And if we vote in 2020, he doesn't have a chance to win, but I'm not sure we'll vote. And I'm concerned about what we do about the impeachment situation. So many people are saying that they need to start the process. And I think it's about to get started. Uh, there's no way he'll be removed uh, by, by the Senate because he has control of the Republican Party and every Republican that's made any iteration against him, lost in primary. And so they want the job. But it was a couple of things. One that John asked about, uh, I watched President Obama's term as president, and when he ran for president, I think pretty objectively, and no claims of campaign violations, I recall, ever came up. If they had, it, they would have removed him. Uh, so I don't know where you got that information from. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing about the Mueller's report and what he was trying to do, what you're dealing with is something called intent. And you really can't prove intent. And I think that's what the Mueller, Mueller report was saying. You know, just by his iterations and his tweets, suggests that he has a more favorable trust in Russia and North Korea than he does the people in the intelligence community. And then they, uh, I think they're trying to do the best job they can, but it's hard when the leader is working against you. Uh, so I think that's one of the problems. And then the fact that the deal, the Department of Justice Department said that you can't you can indict a sitting president. And so Mueller made that up front. And he also made so he wasn't going to talk about nothing that was not in the report. So that's why some of the things were not dealt with in that report. And I, Continue to do a lot of people say he seemed tired, but he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be there, yeah. and so he he was working against a, a number of things. Uh, I think the big thing I think he's done he swears to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America, mm -hmm. and he hasn't done that, and that's a reason enough to determine to impeach him and remove him because that's critical. Even federal employees like you and I, we had to swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. And if we didn't, his manifest would be terminated. The same thing should apply to him. There are plenty of reasons to terminate, but I think what Pelosi's, uh, Congressman, uh, Speaker Pelosi is talking about is she's a theory that if he won't be removed, and President Trump has such a way with his base that anything he does is okay. And that's what they're worried about. And I don't know, I'm, it, it's, I'm disappointed with our Congress because there's no uh, bipartisan nothing going on. And we have a bill that the House passed in February dealing with uh, issues that we encountered last week and voting rights and things of that nature. Uh, the, 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 the Miller report clearly indicated Russia interfered. The FBI and the, and the CIA pointed it out before. They interfered and they still interfere. They are doing it right now. And, uh, and we aren't doing anything about it. That visible that we're doing anything about it. So uh, I enjoyed your reports and remarks. You documented it. It's not very much 
no, no places for me to criticize it, but I was going to, I think, I'm not sure what the political risk would be if they start the impeachment process. But just like you said, a lot of information they're having a problem getting right now, they will get it then if you look at the, the situation they went through when President Nixon went through this process. The courts have already said presidents, and, and Roberts is the president's guy. He's going to stick with presidents. So <laughs> if it comes up again, they'll get the same kind of ruling from the court if it gets to the Supreme Court. So uh, I think uh, I, it could work both ways. It could benefit them. It may, it may energize Democrats to vote, or it may turn some off. So I don't really know what to do. So I guess they may be in a better position to see that than I am. So I thank you for your report, and I enjoy it. I'm going to take a little different tack on this. Um, there's a lot of opinions here. And I would say they're mostly leaning towards the Democrat side tonight. But uh, when Trump has a rally, he has like 20 to 50,000 people show up, and there's not enough room for all the people to get inside. They have to set up screens outside for all the people that come. Uh, so to say that Trump doesn't have popular support is simply not true. Uh, when Biden shows up for a rally, the parking lot is empty. Uh, and there may be a few people walking around, but the, there's no rally for a Democrat candidate has gathered more than a few hundred people. How about Beto? Oh. Beto, Beto had a few hundred people show up in El Paso. Trump had well over 20,000. So anyway, looking at that, and then looking at the fact that in a Democrat-controlled House, the vote against impeachment was 332 to 95. And that's with mostly Democrats. So those Democrats in the House who are fully aware of the situation and everything that Trump has supposedly done or not done don't think that Trump is impeachable. Uh, I don't see how that's going to change. And as the popular support, as the polls, for instance, to say that, that Trump doesn't have more than 50% support, um, if those polls are taken by the same people that said Hillary Clinton had a 98% chance of winning, I wouldn't put too much faith in those polls. I wasn't going to speak about this, but um, as it relates to crowds attending, okay, and overflow into the parking lots. I don't know if you, um, you know, caught recent coverage of that, even though they set up the big screen, and I can't remember, it wasn't El Paso, I don't think it was the one following that. They had the big screen set up there, and uh, basically while Trump was inside, was it Ohio? Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's what it was, and um, you know, the screen was definitely there, and it was definitely showing what was going on inside. All that were, was in the parking lot were a few deck chairs, uh, some garbage, and it was empty. Okay? Garbage is right. And, <laughs> sorry? Garbage is right. Garbage is right, <laughs> exactly. Okay, Obama's but, inauguration. Oh, but Obama always do crowds. But that's not a contest about even crowds. It is about what happens to the crowd when the person gets up and speaks, okay? And as it relates to um, the, was it Ohio where they were saying, oh no, which was the one recently where it was sent her back? Uh, North Carolina. North, North Carolina. Carolina, okay. North Carolina. I, that's another <coughs> thing too. Anyone that wins the presidency and then can claim the day following being sworn into office that they're running for re-election and then gets to fly all over the country at our expense to be his own PR agent, okay, is also, to me, a violation of the office. Because he's supposed to have his rear end back in Washington doing the job that he was elected to do, not self-promoting. And it's not even policies per se, so it's disgusting and not that, but the send her back rally for a president of the United States, 
the crowd that you speak of, they're there and they're chanting. They've already been revved up even before Trump's hit the stage, not only through his Twitter, but apparently his daughter-in-law, before that rally, was out there along with whatever country western singer they may have had for the evening. Um, but in any case, uh, and saying, so President Trump says, if you don't like, you know, being in this country, what can you do? And then, of course, they all chanted leave. So they were all almost frothing at the mouth by the time he got out there to begin with. And um, for this, you know, person to stand there and allow them to chant this for the 12, 13 seconds and then deny that he didn't encourage it is utter rubbish. And not only that, back to the crowd. Even if you weren't chanting, sent her back, and you were a fervent report, um, supporter of him or anyone else that was bringing on this behavior, at some point, wouldn't it occur to you, what's going on here? Do I really belong here? Is this an American thing to do? What kind of rabid mob have I put myself inside of? So, and all of the behaviors of this president, and it's already been well acclaimed that he's a narcissist. I call him, and I quote it from someone else originally a, a little while back, he's a malignant narcissist. Okay, he's a pathological liar. It's documented, words his mouth. You have ears, you have eyes. Connect the dots, please. Because they should not, at this stage, into this presidency, be any doubt in anyone's mind that we're not dealing with the most ethical body walking the streets here, okay? Money also pays for fascism, okay? And that has truly been exhibited to us, what he's done with his cabinet or what have you, and the tax bill and all that jazz. But when you look at Trump, even with the, um, uh, the day after Comey was fired, here he is in the Oval Office having a big old chuckle about that with the Russian ambassador and some other Russians, I guess. And to me, that was akin to Hitler and his cronies having a good old belly laugh as he was watching film of, you know, von Stauffenberg and crew being hung by piano wire. This is a really serious problem. And anyone that thinks that someone that they supported can stand there even before he was elected and say, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and they'd still support me. And horribly so, it is something that obviously is true. And enough is enough. Or will, if he does shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, will you even care? Okay? If you think that this is making America great again, it isn't. And as far as I'm concerned, the El Paso shooting, I do attribute that to him. Just like I attribute every ugly word that's come out of the mouth of either kids or adults against blacks, Hispanics, or what have you. And they also, high school kids telling, you know, Hispanic kids go back to where you belong. This was before last week, long before. So, um, and then what does he do in response to that? He makes a film to music, like it's a video, you know, his, his visit to the victims, who none of them refuse, uh, they all refuse to see him, you know, in, in El Paso. This is narcissism on steroids. So all I can say is America better wake up to itself because the worst is yet to come. Kenneth, I'd like to say you did a nice job there. Very nice job. Uh, I'm up here basically not to talk about the report too much. I am up here to talk about Trump. Though. 
uh, I happened to see on television one of the stations, you know, that has fake news, ABC, CBS, some of these stations, uh, the word Lugenpresse was said. Lugenpresse. Do you know what Lugenpresse means? Fake news. Do you know where it came from? Adolf Hitler. And that's the main thing. We, we constantly hear our president say fake news. First Amendment. In other words, he wants to put in everybody's head that this is fake news. That the only news you should <laughs> listen to is Trump news, Fox news. And this is ridiculous. Absolutely. I had seen on PBS a series which was very interesting. It was Dictator's Playbook. They had Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, Idi Amin, Franco. And the first thing they do is take the press and oppress the press as much as they can. And this is being done right before our eyes. You know, this country, I wore the uniform of also, like Kenneth did. And I have never end time. Susan, Susan's got to get end time. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the point being, I have never been more ashamed of what's going on in our country than I am now. I mean, it, it almost brings me to tears to see what's happening. It's not, it's not the same, same country that I grew up in or anything else. And I remember a, a sessions I had. Is it too loud or too? Too loud. Oh, it's too loud? It's probably me then. My ears, I can't hear. So it, it, anyway, the... The point being, it's been brought up about fascism. We are very close to it. The corporations got all the tax breaks, etc. This is just the way it is. Fascism is a dictator along with the military industrial complex. And we have to be aware. We have to impeach this man. Even if they won't convict him, we'll see if any of the Republicans got any guts whatsoever and have any, any faith in this country. Thank you. Oh. You're waiting for me, John, huh? Yeah. I'm waiting for you. What did you mean, George? <laughs> oh, Gene's got him. If the Democratic Party goes to uh, follow through on impeachment, I would say go for it. That's going to be your little big horn. That's going to be Custer's last stand. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's not going to be popular. It's not going to work out the way you think. And I would say one of the dichotomies here, the big breaks, is we really do have two medias in this country. And there's a certain portion of the media we call mainstream media. And they've been imp impeaching Trump before he was uh, even elected. It's, uh, it's been an ongoing thing. And I would just say that uh, the uh, problem you're going to run into is just for instance, with the release of the uh, Bruce or 302s today. Now we have more information coming out. We have information coming out on what was actually going on. And uh, it's beginning to look more and more like you had uh, a multi-agency coup against candidate Trump. And then later on, uh, for President-elect Trump and, and then President Trump. This is uh, serious stuff, folks. You're talking about uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, this, uh, this rates as treason and sedition. And some of the very intelligence agencies and uh, 
uh, State Department and uh, FBI, DOJ, they all had their players involved. And uh, I think you're going to get more on this as time goes on. It's going to be rolling out slowly, and you're going to find that your media has been lying to you. And uh, I don't know who Trump is. I think there's been this magic trick played upon the American people here where it's all Trump, Trump, Trump. All the focus is on Trump, on Trump's misdeeds, on Trump this, Trump that. If the DNC was hacked and there wasn't anything in there but lollipops, then there wouldn't have ever been an issue. Why did, uh, why did Julian Assange with WikiLeaks uh, uh, put the uh, DNC emails out there? Because it showed a face of the DNC and people inside the DNC that was not at all attractive. Now, my information says that uh, Seth Rich was the uh, leaker from the DNC, and uh, just recently Ed Butowski here from Dallas, uh, a Dallas uh, millionaire, has filed a lawsuit for all of the uh, trouble he has uh, undergone on, uh, on this whole Seth Rich case. Butowski had a conversation with Ellen Ratner. Ellen Ratner was the sister of Michael Ratner, who passed away, but for years Michael Ratner was Julian Assange's attorney. And Ellen Ratner had a six-hour meeting with Assange in the embassy, and uh, Assange gave her a message for the Rich family to let them know that uh, their son Rich Son, their son Seth and Aaron, actually both of them, had been involved in the DNC leak and that uh, they had actually received uh, a payment from Julian Assange from WikiLeaks. And this flies in the face of the entire Russia collusion narrative. If it doesn't overturn it, it, it does serious damage because if you didn't have the DNC leak, then where did the Russians actually, where did they actually cause anything with the election? Where did they change a single vote? So you have ongoing information uh, releasing on this that you're not going to hear on the mainstream media. They're very quiet about this. Um, so this is, keeps on, pardon me? Does Fox present it? Fox only presents a, a certain part of it, but uh, you're getting more of it, more of it all the time. But uh, did you hear about the uh, did you hear about the 302s just released, just this last? See, this is uh, 302 what? 302s are uh, FBI investigative reports. It's uh, a report written up when FBI has any kind of a meeting or briefing or something like that. And uh, these had to do with Bruce Orr. And Fusion GPS, Bruce Orr's wife, Nellie Orr, worked for Fusion GPS. And uh, I guess I'm uh, up on my time here. Are we getting close? Yeah. Pretty close. There's uh, there's really too much to, to go into. This is a big discussion. I'm just going to say you're, you're going to find out. It's not going to be a good thing. I'm the last one standing. No more? Any more? Anyone else want to say something there? Anyway. Julie, come on. Come on, Julie. I won't mind. <laughs> right. I got you. Julie, you don't have to tell no, us. Tom, you don't we know you'll be respectful. I got you. We'll be fine. Five minutes we go to six, whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. Every time I hear him speak, uh, I think, well, wow, wow. <laughs> it's really good, informative. My purpose tonight in coming here was to answer. Nancy Pelosi had said that um, she preferred prison to impeachment. And so uh, my question about what does it uh, 
impeachment achieved was kind of geared toward that way. And I, uh, you answered it very well. But I, um, I still kept thinking, but she prefers prison. And um, he is a criminal. To me, he's a criminal. Not just to me, but he's been convicted of a lot of things, but he pays his way out. Um, I did want to share a couple of tidbits. Uh, somebody says there's no bipartisanism. There actually now is in Congress a caucus called the Problem Solver Caucus, and it is bipartisan. They work specifically. I don't know what they've achieved. I don't know who's on it or anything. But uh, this class I told y'all I was taking, the instructor pointed that out. And El Paso was mentioned. Uh, I don't know about the size, but it has been reported two or three times in the news that when Donald Trump went to El Paso for his rally, uh, he incurred a huge, I guess, $500,000 500, bill, and Beto's uh, incurred a bill too. Um, Beto paid his, Donald Trump doesn't pay his bills. He doesn't oh, pay them. Um, you know, you have the expression, you can't get blood from a turnip. He is an amoral person, and what do we expect to get from an amoral person? People are actually dying. Uh, Dateline, many years ago, long before Donald Trump even had the celebrity show, uh, they were t investigating a murder in Tucson, Arizona, and it turns out that they were mob members, members and Donald Trump was socializing with them. These are his associates. He has his connections with the mob, and the um, when Trump Tower was built, they said it was built at a time when uh, nobody could get anything built hardly in New York because of a cement strike or something. Yet Trump Tower kept going up, and what they found out was members of the mob went to the workers and held a knife to their throats to get them to build his tower. He swindled people in Atlantic City out of their life savings. I forget how many thousands of people here in Texans. He lost the suit for fraud at the, his Trump University. Um, he brags about sexually harassing women. His wife, one of his former wives, did say he raped her. She dropped the charges when, when um, he paid her a settlement. But uh, the court documents showed that he had gone to get something done, a bald spot on his head or something, and she'd recommended this doctor to work on him, and it really hurt him, and he was upset. So he went home and he jerked hair out of her head. He tore hair out of her head. She locked herself in the, in the, in the bathroom, stayed there all night. The next morning, he said, does it hurt? And they said his oldest son never spoke to him for a year after that event. This is who we have as President of the United States. You know, what do we expect to get from a person like that? And he stands in front of a crowd after women start talking about being sexually harassed. He stands in front of a crowd with young boys on the stage behind him telling the boys to beware that women were going to accuse them. You know, little boys, little boys, hearing the President of the United States say this. That's all I have to say. Well, sure. are raw. Uh, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a great-grandmother, and I'm a mother to people that are younger to me, that aren't related by blood, but they are like my children. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of seeing children in cages. I'm tired of seeing people coming here for asylum and treated the way they are. I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of how the rest of the world views America. I grew up in the 50s, and this is not the America 
that I want that's out there today. I want a respect back from the rest of the world, and I'm all for impeachment. I want impeachment. Whether they finish it up or not, and it doesn't get done, and we get a new president, hopefully, I want the process to go through. We, we just aren't what we used to be. And you want to go back? I would like to go back with a lot of those aspects that we had. Uh, we just are not what we used to be. We are not respected. Thank you. I guess I'm the last one standing. I don't see anybody else who wants to come up here. I did say that. I came up here. But anyway. Uh, I want to thank our speaker. I think he did a terrific job here tonight. Yeah, good uh, guys, I think he, uh, he's convinced me that whether we should impeach him, and that's 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 goes without without saying. Uh, I'm reminded of when Nixon was impeached. Uh, the Republicans didn't want to impeach him until until they had the tapes from Washington, which were conclusive that he was that he was wrong. And then the impeachment went through and the Republicans impeached them. So that, that's something to remember. We don't have the tapes this time, but we have we have huge amount of evidence. And if the public gets aware of this, it'll be up to the Republican people to impeach them. And I think either way, if you don't impeach him, you're going to be in worse worse position because when he runs again, he'll be talking about how he, he never was impeached. So. I'm for impeachment, and I'm for pushing it, and thank you very much, and you, you get the last word. I think the rule is set. Yeah. <laughs> you get the last word. Okay. Once again, uh, thank, thank, thank everybody uh, for this opportunity to, to speak to you guys tonight. The, uh, the whole question of impeachment is such, a, is such a critical issue for our country right now because it's going to be one of the things that's going to determine what country, kind of country we are going forward in the future. Uh, there's a couple of things in response to some of the things that people said that I wanted to touch on real briefly. We talked about whether or not we think Trump has support, and, and one of the speakers thought that Trump had support because he has big rallies. Uh, I just want to have a data point. I've been to rallies with Democratic candidates that had more than a few hundred people. Bernie Sanders uh, rallies, for example, in 2016 were comparable in size to Trump rallies. They, I, I've, been to, I've been to one here and there, so I know it. I'm not, that's not a theory. I, I saw that myself. Uh, the other thing about the, the importance of whether or not Trump has enough political support, it's a critical thing to understand. You have to remember, this is a president that won the presidency while losing the popular vote by nearly 3 million votes. The, the polls were not wrong in that respect. Their estimate of how many votes Hillary Clinton would get nationally were right. They just weren't right about specific states like Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania or, or Michigan, where they didn't have good polling data anyway. But the overall national polls were correct. She got about this percentage of the vote that they thought she would get. It is very important that he's never gone above 50% in national polls. That tells you he is weak. Trump has intense support, but he doesn't have broad support. There is a difference. Yes, his supporters love him to death, but they only get to vote one time. Okay? So he doesn't multiply votes because of the passion of his, of his supporters. We have to understand that. We just beat the Trump administration in 2018 in the congressional elections. There's a reason why we're wondering whether or not Nancy Pelosi is going to impeach him, because Nancy Pelosi got the job because we got 9 million more votes in 2018. OK? So another speaker said this is our little bighorn. Yeah, it's going to be a little bighorn, but Trump is, 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 the, is the general custer. He's got the blonde hair and the racist attitude. We got the numbers. Anyway, this is that's it for tonight. 
Uh, we are, are, they kick us out of here at 10.30, just so you know. And uh, our speaker is here. You can talk to him. And we'll see you all next week, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.